Hello, this roundtable discussion will focus on cybercrime and homeland security. Uh, context has usefully been provided by Foreign Secretary William Hague, who recently spoke of the exponential rise in the incidence of cyber attacks aimed at government departments. Uh, while GCHQ's Ian Lobham warned that the UK's economic well being is under threat from both organised cybercrime and foreign intelligence agencies. Well, with me to discuss the nature of modern cybercrime and what can be done to prevent it and deal with it are Andrew Beckett, who's the head of cybersecurity at Cassidian, Dr. Les Ball, a lecturer in the School of Computing and Engineering Systems at the University of Abite Dundee, Margaret Gilmore, a senior research fellow with a special interest in homeland security, as uh, she's from the think tank, the Royal United Services Institute. And on my far right, uh, Richard Nethercott, Head of Security at Logica, our host today here at Logica's Innovation Centre in central London. So, Margaret, if I could begin with you, um, in the context of homeland security, what is cybercrime? Well, the cyber criminal is uh, the person who has set up a website and wants to sell fake tickets to the Olympics. It's the state that wants to uh, hack into the Ministry of Defence and get our defence secrets or any other government street secrets, economic secrets. It's uh, the dodgy private company who wants to uh, hack into Logica and find out what Logica is planning for the future and steal those secrets. Um, and it's, of course, you know, the one that we all really know about. It's the big clo global crime syndicate, which is trying to steal identities and take our credit cards and ad identities and also take money out of our bank accounts. OK, so let's get the scale of threat in perspective. And Margaret says there it's a war being fought on several fronts, isn't it? Um, who does it range from, do you think? Is this a modern phenomenon now that it's, it, it, it's so prevalent? I mean, the Internet's been around for a long time. Are we enduring something now that is very new? I think the, uh, the, the pressure's on, on criminals to continue to make money, and this is an easy way of making money. Um, if you look at traditional money laundering, um, where they would take proceeds from crime and, 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 and launder it so that it could be redistributed into the economy, now you can move that money around at the click of a button. Um, it's just the criminals getting up to date. And I suppose the other issue is, is what took me by surprise when you're looking into this is that really we can all be party to it. I mean, somebody at work whose terminal might be compromised can end up compromising the entire business, can't they? Very easily. Um, viruses um, quite readily spread throughout networks. They self-replicate um, in an awful lot of scenarios. And what we're seeing um, with the work we're doing, um, looking at advanced persistent threats, um, once they're in, once they've got that foothold, created that back door, um, they, they spread across your network very quickly and, and you're losing data, be it trade secrets, IPR, or in, uh, in the case of government, um, actual state secrets. Um, it's happening on an alarming scale. And can I turn to you, Richard? I mean, you know, Logica is present in very many countries. Is this something unique to us? It suddenly seems to have got on the agenda, you know, then cyber attacks are now tier one threats. Is this something we've woken up to slowly? Um, I don't know, we've uh, uh, woken up to it slowly. I would say that uh, the general connectivity of digital electronics uh, and communications around the world has really driven a lot of this at the moment. Um, maybe some of the Western countries use digital electronics far more than, than other countries, and so maybe we see um, the first vanguards, if you like, of some of these attacks at the present, and, and I think we're going to see more in the future because the world's all about information. Information's all digital now, uh, and it just makes it more accessible for people anywhere in the world. And I wonder also, I mean, for a country like ours, which is very much a knowledge economy, um, presumably the theft of intellectual property, whatever it might be, uh, that can have an enormous consequence, can't mm, it? Absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the things that we're most wary of, certainly in logic, and I'm sure many other uh, industrial organisations are, or at least should be. Um, and certainly the UK government is making sure that they warn everybody about the threats of that. Um, intellectual property is obviously, from a knowledge economy point of view, absolutely vital in our uh, competition in the world in terms of the exports that the UK can manage in the future. And of course, if all that is, if you like, stolen before we attempt to use it, uh, our value is lost. And uh, Les, you're from the academic end of the spectrum. I mean, mm -hmm. what's your take on the cyber war that we're fighting at the moment? I take two sides here. Um, one side is the technical side, which we've discussed a little bit already. Uh, for, for you know the attacker, uh, the, the attacker using a tech, using technical um, processes to achieve that. But on the other side, you said earlier about the internet um, being around a while, but it's a place so easy to meet on the internet as well. It's not to me. It's not just a place uh, you might go to attack someone else. It's actually a place you might go to meet somebody as well. 
So there's another side to this, and that people are actually talking to each other over the internet, and they're leaving digital trails of that too. But it's also an easy place to hide, of course, isn't it? Because for, for the criminals, you don't have to put a stocking over your head and take a bit of a risk. Mm. I mean, mm. you could be anywhere in the world making your cyber attack and stealing in mm. that kind of way. Yeah. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Because I think, you know, the Internet, by definition, has no boundaries. So just in terms of, uh, of explanation, and presumably it is possible for you to launch an attack from anywhere in the world with it almost being untraceable. Absolutely, although sometimes it is mistraceable. By coincidence, this week I was looking at one of my spams that came up and it was demanding some more information on a specific bank account. We all get them. And I noticed that this came from uh, Brazil. And it actually, you know, they had the nerve to ask all these questions and then say that I had to access this, um, bank, uh, this uh, email and it was coming from a BR, you know, dot com. And you could tell that it was coming from Brazil. So, yeah, they can, they can come from anywhere. You just have no idea. It's true, though, isn't it? That what, what surprised me as well is that you, know, that you hear stories about militia attacks on government departments, whether it's the Foreign Office or, indeed, the White House. Now, I'm an average computer user, and I know pretty much not to open an attachment unless I know exactly where it's from. I mean, it, it strikes me, um, are we in a situation where, actually, there's a knowledge gap still about how to, at the most basic level, to prevent these threats? I think there's a lot of knowledge gaps, um, not only in the people that are perhaps opening the emails at the moment, uh, but there's a complete change, I think, coming in terms of the children that are coming up through schools and universities and into the workplace in the future. They will have a completely different view upon privacy, upon security generally, upon the use of mobile phones, upon the use of computers than maybe the people in, in the workplace currently have. Um, so I think not only is there some gaps at the moment, the whole world is going to change in the future. Do you think there's a possibility that by definition as those youngsters grow older that actually some of the security breaches will be tightened up because they'll be more savvy? Well, that's an interest, that is a very interesting point in terms of will they be more savvy or, as many people say, will they bring their, um, will they bring their sort of experience of mobile uh, computing and of social networking into the workplace and expect to see that which, with much less privacy and security, arguably? In other words, will they care? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah so it's an, in, it's an interesting <laughs> question as to, to how companies would then operate in the future uh, in a generation change, how would they operate? Um, I'm of the view that I think they will become more savvy, um, but many people are of the opposite view. And also, I suppose the other phenomenon um, is that you, say, 50 years ago, you had educated people who might stumble into white-collar crime, might be fraud. And now, presumably, you have very educated young people who are good at maths and good at physics, good at computing, who may stumble upon the opportunity to, to turn this into crime. Is that, is that another thing that's happening out there? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'd say that you stumble into crime. I think in most cases it's a, um, a conscious decision. I think certainly with the way that some of our legislation is worded and indeed some of the areas where there isn't legislation per se, it's very easily easy to accidentally break the law. Um, but I think there's a distinction between accidentally breaking the law, particularly around the Computer Misuse Act, and actually becoming a cyber criminal um, and, 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 and setting out with uh, a criminal intent to defraud, to steal, or, or whatever it may be. Um, I think a lot of the, um, the, the, the the young people we're seeing coming through now, <coughs> excuse me, have the the skills and the capability to do it, um, and certainly you know, some of the the, the, the easier attacks uh, to mount denial of service and things like that. Um, but it does take intent to to cross that boundary rather than stumbling into it. As well, you're yeah, going sorry, I beg your pardon. It's up to us to talk more, in my opinion, all four of us, to close these gaps that you're talking about. Um, yes, we, we, tra we train our students technically to, well, we train them in the prevention area or to, to, you know, to, to safeguard our systems against attacks. So in, in that respect, they need to know what the attacks are, of course. Um, but I think we need, to, we need to bring law more into the courses. We need our courses to be, have this balance of technical, law, business, risk, all of this needs to come together, I would say. I suppose the other side of the coin is that something we'll touch on later is, is that, um, that for every young person who might be stumbling into or deliberately going into crime, there are those who can be encouraged to go into prevention. And that, is that another knowledge gap that we have, that we haven't got the expertise out there to deal with incoming threats? Uh, I think it's one area that we particularly need to train more people in, absolutely. I think from what we've seen, corporations who are starting to monitor their own infrastructure to detect um, either attacks from outside or loss of their own data are finding that the, the level of analysis that's required from a sort of a manual perspective is actually exceeding their ability to find people to do that. 
so, so it is one area I think that certainly in the short term is going to be something that we need to focus upon. But one of the things that um, in the UK has um, done in the last year, we saw the first UK Cyber Security Challenge, which invited thousands of people from, uh, from around the country to take part in a series of cyber security challenges um, that just raised awareness, um, but also identified people from um, many, many different walks of life who had an aptitude for cyber security raised the profile of cyber security and got dozens of people into the business of defending our networks, um, both at a government and an enterprise level. Can I ask you, um, in that context, you know, we, the, we know that the threats are being ramped up and they're coming from all directions. Um, one thing I was unclear about, I mean, if somebody launches an attack, say, on a defence-related industry and is looking to steal intellectual property of one sort, is that a criminal act by a criminal gang, or is it a state-sponsored act? Are we at war with other states trying to pull that off? Well, it depends who's mounting it and what the reasons are. Um, there are prevalent examples of both. Um, you know, we, we see um, activists doing it for um, political purposes, just to raise awareness of whatever their cause may be. Um, we see individuals with a particular gripe um, doing it uh, again for, for a, you know, a political reason but it tends to be more personal um, but there is also and obviously state-sponsored attacks where um, our enemies are, are looking to gain access to our secrets um, either to understand our, our weapons, our infrastructure, our capabilities um, uh, and in, in that respect it's, it's very little different from the probing attacks of the Cold War where we saw regular flights to test our air defences. These days it's probing attacks to test our cyber defences. Is that the way you would see it, Margaret? I mean, are we at war in, in cyberspace? Well, a lot of people would argue that if you go in and take out a country, say, electricity, and people die as, as a result because the transport systems fail or, you know, you can't get refrigeration or what, for whatever reason a lot of people die, or uh, there's some kind of a disaster um, at, a, at, you know, a nuclear plant or something like that as a, as a result, then uh, people die, and they've done it for malicious reasons, that it would be an act of war. Mm. Um, it hasn't been tested, but you, you, know, you can see a lot going on. There was the issue over um, the, the cyber war and the war of words over cyber, I should say, that went on between Iran, for example, and the US, where they, you know, it's quite clear that both sides um, have you know, used mm. cyber attack as a means of attacking the enemy. Yes, I suppose it's true, isn't it, that, you know, that Ian Lobham at GCHQ talks about fighting on various fronts. I suppose it's also true that we have an attack capability of Absolutely. some kind. Whether or not we deploy yes. it or not, we'll probably never know. Um, I mean, I, I'm just curious to know, I mean, is there such a thing these days as a typical cyber attack? Or are they on so vast an array of, of different devices that you, that you can't really describe them as typical? Well, I think the whole, whole idea is that many of these attacks evolve, but you see most definitely certain types of attack. Whether you call them typical or not, I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to say. Um, but there's certain types of, I mean, the DDoS attacks, so the denial of service type attacks that you see, you know, they're, they're sort of fairly well known as a fairly certain type of those. Um, other, other attacks that exploit vulnerabilities that enable people to exfiltrate data, sort of some of those are rarely, uh, fairly well known, but again, they're going to mutate and evolve slightly as the defences improve. Um, and in fact, I think probably for organisations, one of the main focus uh, areas they need to look at is um, how they deal with the new types of attack as they evolve. So threat intelligence uh, information that they might be able to acquire that can perhaps forewarn them of new types of things that might come up. Um, because over time I'd like to think that most people are going to become au fait with and able to defend against the, the more typical attacks. That begs the question, doesn't it, of, of what our strategic response is going to be to this. So if I start with you, um, £650 million pounds the government is ploughing into combating cyber attacks. Is it enough or is it just paper over a few cracks? I think as a, as a, as a UK economy, um, £650 million isn't enough. Um, the, uh, um, the money that's been allocated is largely being spent on defending um, the infrastructure, the um, government departments and um, the, the, the critical national infrastructure. Enterprise too has to shoulder its share of the burden, um, and it uh, it's down to us all, um, as uh, large organisations, small organisations, but also as individuals, to uh, to take some practical steps to defend our, our network, our IT, our information. Um, Six hundred and fifty isn't going to buy you um, a magic bullet. 
um, that's going to solve all of these problems, but it is a step in the right direction and will help to protect the, uh, the national infrastructure. Especially in the context of, you know, one estimate saying that cyber crimes cost in the economy over £25 billion, pounds. 650 doesn't seem a great deal, but could 650 be well spent educating people? Because one of the things that came out in the Chatham House report very much it seemed to me was, was that there was a gulf of knowledge between, for example, board members of a major company and people down on the ground who are operating computer terminals, say, mm. and IT somewhere in between as a fiefdom, you know, keeping everything around themselves. Mm. Uh, what can we do to educate companies to operate more efficiently? Well, I think we're certainly at the starting point, aren't we, of, of educating the whole population about cyber security. Um, and so a lot of the conversations we see are associated with how do we get people in the workforce to, to understand the issues, to address, as they say, the 80% of, of the uh, cyber security threats uh, that are there. Once we've got that education into, into the population, if you like, I think there's still going to be very much a, a need uh, for some experts to continue to defend the country, as it were. Um, in the same way that you rely upon other, th other services to be secure. People are going to rely upon electronic infrastructure to be secure. Uh, yes, they will need to know that they shouldn't do certain silly things, but over and above that, the more sophisticated attacks that would not really be dependent upon people doing silly things, we still need to defend the country against that. Um, so I think that money is going to go through a cycle of initially perhaps um, almost discovery at the moment, the 650 million. Um, then we go through a cycle where we see people being educated, absolutely, as you say, and then perhaps into a state where we do recognise that there needs to be this expert cadre, if you like, of people that can continually monitor and defend. And then you get into all kinds of conversations about surveillance and monitoring of your infrastructure, the fact that most of the UK infrastructure is privatised, um, and, and all the different things that we as, as UK would need to do differently to some of the other countries where they haven't got quite the same issues as we've got. Is that a problem that... that because so much of the critical national infrastructure is in private hands, that government and the CNI don't really talk to each other? Well, I, I wouldn't say the government and the CNI don't, don't talk to each other, but it's a different conversation, arguably, perhaps, in, than in some other countries. Um, and in the, in the UK, we've tended to do it by exactly that, by talking to each other. We haven't been able to necessarily industrialise the defences, um, and I think maybe we need to work our way around that in the future. In terms of best practice, that seems to be another gulf, if I'm as a layman. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'd agree. I mean, because there's still discussion on the infrastructure front on who polices mm. um, privately owned parts of the infrastructure. Do you bring in your own, you know, should the private company be policing security around, you know, electricity station or should the government mm. or a nuclear station, who should pay for it? So if, if you're still having arguments on that, you haven't really, you can't really then remove that to a much more complex issue of who polices or looks at or is responsible for paying for security on the internet. So I think that's a difficult one. Um, and um, you just mentioned there, you know, buying the magic bullet. Well, we don't know what the magic bullet is. We don't know what the single thing is. I mean, there isn't one, obviously, to, to, to solve the problem of internet security. But I think we also need to step back. And I know the government has a cyber strategy, but the fact that we're all around this table still discussing it, we're not really that clear of what that strategy is. And then until we know what the rules are, what the line beyond which the government thinks we should not go really is, and it's, it's absolutely clear, then it's really difficult to see that they have a clear enough strategy to start applying rules to. And as part of that sort of lack of strategy, I mean, there was a lot of criticism of the government that it doesn't really basically share intelligence with industry. Is that true? And if so, why? I don't know if the government shares intelligence with industry. I would have thought maybe a little bit the other way around. Why would industry want to share inter intelligence with government? You've got to be really trusting to start you know, sharing that type of intelligence. I think that it, you, you've just got to have an understanding of how the whole cyber security thing works and ha you have to talk on that level, but I can't imagine you wanting to share your secrets. With well, I mean, I think there's, <laughs> where, where there's uh, benefit to be had by both sides, and I think that sharing will, will take place, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's certain things I'm sure that the government can help logically with in terms of all the government departments that we provide outsourcing services for. Uh, and similarly, some of our experiences in some of the attacks that might occur on those outsourcing uh, clients would be interesting to government. So I think there probably is a little bit of a sharing that can occur there for the benefit of all. But again, we need to, in the, work, in the future, work towards 
an industrialization, as I would call it, of that process, where much quicker we can, we can share that information, identify what's going on in the infrastructure, and the, company as a, uh, the country as a whole, if you like, take action upon things that are going on from outside. I mean, we have seen... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you were talking about intelligence. I think it was 2007, Jonathan Evans, the head of MI5, first warned 300 British businesses right. that they mm -hmm. had been attacked. Mm -hmm. So there is that level of intelligence sharing. If MI5 gets word that Logica is under attack or somebody else is under attack, they, they, they're sharing that. How much detail they then gave the businesses, I don't know. Mm. There's, um, we, we have got steps in place for this kind of sharing at a very basic level. Things like GovCert UK um, collates information on cyber attacks against industry and shares that information um, and puts out alerts to people who've signed up to the service um, so you can help def um, defend yourself um, by, by keeping abreast of these advisories. Um, but there's always ground for more sharing in both directions um, if we're to, to defend ourselves against the growing number of advanced state-sponsored attacks that are, that are hitting uh, the UK. One reason that sharing doesn't seem to take place, um, according to that Chatham House report, was that there seemed to be a perception at board level in many companies that cyber attack was sort of like a risk worth taking. It wasn't being addressed properly. Is that a, do you agree with that perception? Um, I'm not sure that anybody who's looked at Sony recently would share that perception. Um, yeah, they, were, they were attacked in a big way earlier in the year. The chief executive lost his job. Share price went through the floor. Um, sales fell off um, in a big way. It's going to take them years to recover. Um, and I think for, for many boards and chief executives, that really was a wake-up call to the dangers of cyber threat. Um, yes, there will still be some who, who, who take that point of view. Um, and I, I heard an example um, fairly recently where uh, a chief executive, on, on being told that it was likely that his company had been compromised, said, yeah, but you're not going to tell anybody. Um, yeah, they, and they rely on the, on the secrecy. Um, mm. Part of that's structural. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our boards are remunerated based on share price. Um, and to disclose that you've been attacked um, does have a negative impact on your share price. So they want to keep it secret. They don't want to share the information. But as a country, we need to share information. If I'm doing business with you and you've been attacked, if we've got an electronic link to do that business, it affects me as well. We've got to be more open um, uh, uh, with our information exchanges. We've got to share information on defence. Um, otherwise, the vulnerabilities will spread through the back door. But presumably, that's another vital reason for there to be some kind of universal best practice, because my business may be rock-solid secure, but I am obliged to share data mm. or information with you, and you are not secure. So mm. isn't a simple measure to sort of lay down a kind of you know, uh, 10 points that every company should by law be forced to adopt? Mm. Interesting you say by law there. I think best practice will develop and is developing and, and in many people's minds I'm sure there is a best practice currently at this point in time. Um, the, the legal aspect, um, le legislation in this area generally struggles to keep up a little bit I would argue. Um, there are various discussions about how parts of the law should change at the moment. Um, I think maybe what you're suggesting there would be something associated with corporate governance and the various checks <coughs> upon executive officers within organisations, maybe in the same way to a degree as there's perhaps with the Data Protection Act or something like that, or an extension thereof. Um, we haven't seen any sign of it just yet because I think no one really would know what to put in the legislation. But it, at some stage in the future, it, it really does need to come. I suppose also I was thinking that, that to me, I, as it seems glaringly obvious that, that we're not up to speed yet. And so, has, you know, is it too late, or can we make up the lost ground? Um, I, I totally agree with you. We're not, we're not up to speed because we weren't building in security systems when we started espousing this technology in its early days. Whereas a, a, a less developed country is going to come in and start uh, from a much higher level as far as security. Uh, goes. I think uh, on the governance side of things, which is what I can talk about a bit more, I think they're, um, they're working very hard at it, but their resources are, are, are strapped at the moment, so difficult to keep up. So they're trying to put in a lot of rules and laws, but the actual technology, I'm not so sure. We'd probably have to uh, turn to our colleagues over there. Isn't it, uh, another issue here, uh, maybe again this is a case of the, bolt, the, the, the horse is bolted a long time ago, but 
Presumably at some point the civil liberties argument will come up as well because the more that you make systems secure, the more you are presumably prying and looking and monitoring. I mean, are we be, I'm not saying use the term held back by that, probably quite rightly so, but where will the, where will the, the compromise be found, do you think? It, 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 it's always a, a challenging question and it, in many ways it takes us back to an earlier conversation uh, today when we were looking at um, the, the, the next generation's perception of privacy and information sharing. Um, what you and I might consider to be sensitive private information, a lot of young people these days are more than happy to publish on their Facebook pages. Um, so a lot of this is going to come down to, to perception. Um, and I think with such a large spread of, uh, of opinion as to what's private and, um, and what can be shared amongst the public, it's very hard to make a coherent argument for, uh, for privacy or, or, or liberty. Um, it'll be a changing playing field and I, I, I share Richard's view that uh, um, in, in the future there will be significant changes in the way we, we look at privacy um, and what is sensitive personal information. The reality of today's society is we live in a CCTV society mm. and we've accepted it, haven't we? Well, well, mm. I, I mean, <laughs> most people, the public don't care, do they? The, no. uh, generally, yeah. that's a very big generalisation, mm. but if you did a po poll, most people would say, no, we'd far rather have CCTV and, and the f yeah, we know that people can access any email we ever write because, um, but if it's for our security and the safety of the country and keeps us safer we don't mind mm. but there will always be a few people who will say hang on a minute this is you know this is making it so easy for governments or whatever to pry and there is a limit beyond which they should not be doing that there'll always be the civil rights people who will say you know let's hold back let's ch and they will challenge that in the courts so I, I guess the paradox there yeah, but the paradox I suppose is, is that the, the British public embraces CCTV because we unfortunately have you know a section of the population who are prone to antisocial behavior and lawlessness in our city centers I suppose in the world of cyberspace it's a kind of if that doesn't exist you don't need all the monitoring but I suppose the truth is because we're under assault from elsewhere we almost have to play the same game don't you think Mm, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting area in terms of where that balance will land or whether it will ever land in one place it needs to continually move oh. between monitoring and freedom. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think most of the population realise probably how much electronic information is just generally available on the internet about them, let alone government monitoring them. It's just any other individual can look mm. on the internet and find information mm. about anybody, can't they? Mm. Um, and I think it's only gradually the more savvy uh, people who are starting to um, take steps to prevent that uh, but if we were like America, I could see le um, uh, legal cases in terms of sort of privacy violations occurring all over the place in the UK if people really wanted to generate that right. because um, there, there is so much information that people have now got in digital electronic form that easily finds its way into the public uh, mm -hmm. arena. In, in, in most cases, or in many cases, I suspect the individual who really should be the owner of that data didn't want it in the public arena in the first mm -hmm. place. And of course with the internet not having any boundaries, um, what we're increasingly seeing is, is, is different standards um, applied by, by different governments. So uh, mm. I, tr I travel a lot in the Middle East and, and over there things which we see as just standard tools um, for staying in touch with the family like Skype um, are banned. Mm. Um, you just can't get an internet connection, you're shut off if you try, uh, try and open a, 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 a Skype call. Um, so you know, lots of different uh, different standards being applied around the mm -hmm. globe, lack of international legislation to look at either defending privacy or opening up communications, um, whichever side of the coin you happen to be, uh, to be looking at. Um, and, and, and generally just a, a lot more work to be done if we're going to achieve any consensus uh, and agree any set of standards for, uh, for privacy on the internet. Um, uh, and until we do, there will be governments around the globe applying um, monitoring and, and surveillance to different levels, but largely unchecked. Mm -hmm. I think it's indicative of the UK's approach to privacy in terms of some of the identity um, discussions that go on and you know, our aversion to identity cards. If you compare that to other countries, you find it's, it's, uh, there's a marked difference between sort of both the political and maybe the, the, the public's view of um, identities and uh, electronic uh, identity is being held in a big database as opposed to other countries. I mean, we, we don't have ID cards, obviously, for the reasons that are well uh, publicised in terms of, uh, you know, after the Second World War, 
uh, but many other European countries without any concern have got identity cards that can be used for access um, mm. by their citizens to public services. So it's, we, we sort of try to walk this line that, that just makes it very difficult for ourselves, mm. I think. But it's a, it's a valid line, obviously, because you know, that's, the, that's the political and social environment in which we work. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, it seems to me that we've been playing catch-up all the time with the internet revolution and what that has meant for security and for crime. And I suppose also, you know, we're on the brink, if not there already, of a future where everybody has a portable device that contains their mm. life, their business, their entertainment. I mean, what are the implications of portable devices for, for security going forward? I'll start with you. <laughs> well, I think we've only scratched the surface, to be honest. Um, I, I, I mean, there are, there's so many different ways that the, the market could go. It's highly unlikely that it's going to be regulated or legislated in any particular way. And so you're going to have as many different variants out there as you could possibly think of, I suspect, in terms of the way that people would um, use, use the devices, put their own personal data into devices. Other people would then be able to take the big data, if you like, approach and analyse what's going on, work out where people are, what they've been doing, who they've seen last, what they've been buying, without, again, the individual knowing. Um, you know, it, it's just a, a complete unknown in terms of the direction that's going to take. And the implications, do you think, for homeland security? I mean, does, does a device like this make it easier for a foreign agent to launch an attack on a system in this country? Well, uh, of course it does. And, I mean, we know that criminals are using phones all the time and that, you know, you can buy a 20 quid phone now, which can do everything. It can do, you can do your banking on it, you can get onto Facebook on it, you can make your phone calls, and you can have your music on it. So, actually, I, I would say we're already there. And because they're so cheap, um, they're the one thing that could identify, as you say, where you are at any given moment and have been used. I mean, in the so murders, for example, you know, eventually, over weeks, they could track down exactly where you know somebody was at a given time, just because of where the mobile phone was. So that's old technology. Um, but you know, twenty quid ago, you just if you're a criminal, you just chuck it away. These you buy, days, aren't they? I mean, the, the seven seven, once. the seven seven um, uh, uh, bombers had what eighteen, I think, between them. Uh, absolutely, of which they had one each for personal use, and all the rest were carefully used for different parts of, you know, buying equipment, buying explosive, different phoning, Pakistan, whatever, for different parts of their, their um, preparations for those attacks. We started by saying that there is economic warfare being fought, there is state-sponsored cyber terrorism being fought, um, you know, that our economic well-being is under threat, according to the Ian Lobber from GCHQ. Are they all one and the same thing, or are they all different things? And more importantly, are they real? I think they're certainly uh, they're certainly real. Um, we've and we've seen um, many cases of cyber crime um, and indeed cyber warfare. Estonia, Georgia. Um, have we seen cyber terrorism? Uh, one's a, 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 a bit more difficult. Certainly, terrorists use cyberspace in the planning and execution. Um, but are we actually seeing cyber attacks? Um, um, as a terrorist act in its own right, probably not. The uh, the impact is a lot less on the on the public than uh, than a good old traditional bomb or or, or shooting. Um, but I think they are just just different levels of the same thing. The attacks are the same. The uh, the, the the modus operandi is largely the same. It's the motive and, and the target that that, that differ. So, yes, they're real, um, and yes, I would argue they're just escalations of the same thing. I'm particularly interested in the counter-terrorism aspect and the way that um, you say the terrorists, there's no doubt they are communicating with each other over the superhighway somehow. So I'm in, I think open source is under-explored myself. Open source data, you know, you know, whatever it is, whatever's out there on, this, on the ether. I think it's underexplored, and I'm interested in what we can, how we can um, enrich our analysis from open source data. For example, uh, as I said earlier, I'm, in pre I'm interested in the preventative methods. Um, I don't know if you know, there was an, some analysis done after 9-11, not surprisingly, a few months after it, and uh, a publication came out that showed the social network of the hijackers, and it was gleaned purely from open sources, in this case, newspapers. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could analyse digital sources now in real time and stop the next one from happening? That's the theory behind that. 
I suppose, you know, I, you have those, I don't know whether they're fictional in fact, but you have the idea that the Americans can monitor communications and it picks out keywords and it might alert somebody to, you know, the fact that somebody's plump a hijacking or a bombing or whatever. I mean, I think, I think it seems to me, you know, that we're, we're obviously, that there is a threat and we probably aren't um, up to speed with it yet. And I mean, looking more optimistically, I mean, for example, look at business. I mean, a lot of people watching this will be businesses and they'll be wondering what they can do. Um, are there some very, very simple steps they can take now to make their businesses more secure? The answer is, I don't know. I, I would look at it slightly differently and say, um, these, you know, high-tech businesses, and there's no doubt that MI5 and the government and private industry have got all sorts of things that they're using that will blow our minds and you'd, if you saw it on a James Bond film, you wouldn't believe it, but it is happening already. I've absolutely no doubt about that. And you can tell just by the court cases that are coming up against terrorists, that's an easy way of doing it. But then, it, I think you were touching on this, it, it's, it's, it's got to get better. It's, it's the human factor. It's working out from everything that's coming in, the little buzz activities, the buzz words that put, say, say you've got to start looking at this person or that person because in the end you're going to get down to people. Um, at, that's at a later stage. And then at the earlier stage you've still got this issue of, of grooming terrorists and, this, and that's happening all the time. And closing down one network, well, that's you, you know, one website. Up comes the next. It's a difficult one. Are businesses doing enough? I don't know. I'm not in business, so I can't answer that. Well, I'll, I'll probably put that one over to Richard because, I mean, you would say I think Logica's mission, one of them, is to protect businesses, isn't it? And Absolutely, so, yeah. And so I suppose sometimes businesses have to do things to protect themselves. Well, do, they, they should indeed do. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're the best people to protect themselves, so they're in the best position. Um, I think it varies between large and small businesses, to be honest. Um, and yet there might be an interesting reversal there about which, t which size of companies have got the most intellectual property to protect. Because arguably in the UK with the creative industries and that type of thing, there's an argument to say, well, maybe it's the smaller companies that have got more intellectual property to protect. And yet they're in a, a weaker position, maybe, than some of the large companies to actually protect it from, the, from these electronic threats. Um, so I'd certainly like to see more uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies getting involved in the cyber security arena. I think you know, there is the opportunity for us as a country to grow some business uh, from that type of thing. We need to look a little bit at um, how you might export some things that are leading edge, um, and maybe it might take a few years for that to, to come in, to, into play. Um, if, you, if you sort of compare that a little bit with defence contractors in, you know, in, in the past, we, we tend to sell quite a lot of our uh, defence um, equipment, don't we, to, to other countries once there's a little bit long in the tooth maybe. Can we do the same with cyber in the future? I don't know. Maybe cyber is such a global and um, up-to-date issue that you can't do that. I, it's interesting to know. Um, but I think there's the opportunity for some of the big companies to help some of the small companies with the protection of their intellectual property, because I think the big companies know how to do it at the moment. But you've raised an interesting issue there, haven't you, which is that um, it's probably the case that young mathematicians, engineers, physicists need to be encouraged to think that cyber security is a positive industry to go uh, Absolutely. In. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Mm. And is there any way we can do that, Les, from the world of academia? Oh, I think we should go well before academia. <laughs> go back to school. I mean, I'd be quite keen to see this. If, if this is going to be pervasive in society, and we think it probably is going to be the next war uh, game, virtual war, shouldn't we be teaching it in schools? as part of the curriculum as part. Yes, they have IT, but I'm not sure to what degree they get well, I think it, the I education mean, do, about security. Uh, I've got a 13-year-old son, as I'm sure lots of other people have around the table, but um, I think the problem, what I find interesting is that where he has friends who have been brought up to the age of, say, seven or eight in uh, South Korea or China, they are streets ahead when it comes to maths and physics mm -hmm. and to a certain extent chemistry because mm -hmm. they are taught from the age, the, you know, the, the age of three from when they can speak and so they are way, way, way ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you see that they make these great advances on the cyber front and yet they, you know, they're already training their young far ahead of us. So mm -hmm. by the time you get to say 13, if you do have an international mix in the class, you're going to find that the, that the best ones by far are mm -hmm. the ones who've had early training um, over in Asia and places mm -hmm. like that. So we're starting quite late. We need to educate um, our young and indeed our, our old um, on how to defend themselves. We all rely more and more on technology. 
we're all more and more interconnected um, and it, it, it's imperative that we start to, to train people how to defend themselves. The basic steps that you can take to make sure that your, your home computer is properly patched, that you're running antivirus. Um, schools are doing that in some cases, but a lot more needs to be done so that people can be safe online. In a way, as we said, you know, the government's handed out 650 million, you know, the Metropolitan Police have been given a bit to have a cybercrime unit. Is, is it possibly the case that actually the most effective way to start this fight back is from the ground up? You start the, the fight from the ground up, but, uh, but the, that doesn't cure the problems of today. Um, I think the government's probably right that we need, to, uh, we need to stop the attacks today, we need to defend ourselves today. Um, but there certainly is this need for education. Um, and, and, and doing it at grassroots. Um, and Margaret said um, in, in Asia they start training their kids um, at, at three and four so that by the time they're, uh, they're going through schools they're, they're maths and their physics and indeed their science generally is way ahead of, uh, of, of our own students. Um, and they're going to be my, leading the way aren't they in the yeah. future because they, they, their brains are already, you know, they understand it in a way that maybe our children don't. They know how to use Facebook and they know that mummy and daddy say be careful what you put on it and if you put your email your address. So they're given the little lectures, but do they understand the technology? Mm -hmm. I would say in most cases, no. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's, that's fine. I think it's a valid point. Yeah. At the individual level, I'd agree that you need to be defence savvy in your own home, which many people are not. But yes, I'm, uh, I'm very keen that in the future the UK is seen as a, as a lead for cyber security. I think we've got all the capabilities of, of being there. However, I would uh, uh, strike a, a note of caution in terms of the things that Margaret says because it's, it's well known that uh, India and China are generating ten times as many graduates as we are. Uh, and in, in the world of the future, we're going to need to compete against some numbers that are very big. Okay, so it seems um, what we're dealing with is in the long term a war and in the short term there are steps that can be taken. Thanks to Richard, thanks to Margaret, thanks to Les and thanks to Andrew and thanks to you for watching.